Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Marty Roth. I'm the president of the University of Charleston uh, here in West Virginia. I want to welcome everybody to uh, what I'm sure is going to be a very engaging um, hour and a half on how climate change impacts national security. Uh, this event came together as a collaboration with uh, the University of Charleston and the American Security Project. Um, and, you know, there's uh, lots of discussion today um, around the environment and around climate change, but uh, very little actually on the relationship between climate change and national security. So we brought together um, some subject matter experts who can really uh, shed some light on uh, this important relationship. And in so doing, I think this is really consistent with a key pillar of the University of Charleston's mission, which is to prepare um, our students and our broader community uh, for what we call enlightened living, where we want to raise awareness and understanding of important contemporary issues, uh, including those around the environment and security, um, so that we can all be uh, a bit more informed and we can all be a bit more confident about how we can make a positive difference um, with regard to those issues in the communities where we study, where we work, and where we live. So I'm sure uh, by the time we reach 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time today, uh, we'll all um, feel a bit more of that, uh, that confidence. Um, so I think this is going to be a very um, engaging conversation with our subject matter experts. I'll serve as your moderator today. So my role is going to be to introduce um, each of our panelists um, and to encourage all of you uh, to ask questions. And we'll do, the, do so primarily through the chat function um, and uh, towards the end of the um, time we have today. Uh, we'll be happy to share your questions uh, with our uh, panel of experts. But before we get started, I'd first like to uh, introduce our uh, partner from the American Security Project, uh, which is a bipartisan uh, organization which is designed to um, really focus on issues around national security um, and uh, start to kind of enable all of us to start peeling back some of the layers of the onion of the complexity of uh, security issues in this day and age. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce you to Alexandra Hackbarth. Uh, Alexandra is a director of climate and energy security at the American Security Project. Her research focuses on the national security implications of climate change with an emphasis on China and strategic rivalry. Prior to joining the American Security Project, uh, she served two years as a special advisor for forward operations to the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction in Kabul, Afghanistan. Uh, so Alexander, it's a pleasure to partner with the uh, American Security Project today. And I'd like to give you an opportunity to uh, share some uh, words of welcome and um, um, give a little bit more information uh, about the American Security Project with our audience. Thank you, uh, Dr. Roth. Uh, welcome everyone. And thank you uh, for joining our discussion of national security um, and climate change. Um, as Dr. Roth mentioned, this is a very important and timely uh, topic and ASP, the American Security Project is thrilled to be partnering with the University of Charleston to bring you this expert panel. Um, as Dr. Roth mentioned, I'm Alex Hackbart, the Director of Climate and Energy Security at the American Security Project. Um, just to provide you a bit more information on who we are and what we do at the American Security Project. Um, as Dr. Roth mentioned, we are a national security uh, bipartisan think tank based in Washington, DC. Uh, the organization was founded in 2006 by then senators John Kerry, Chuck Hagel, Gary Hart, and uh, Warren Rudman. And climate security has been a pillar of the American Security Project's work since its founding. Um, and while we were sad that uh, John Kerry, Secretary Kerry, had to resign from our board to join the administration, we are thrilled that he's elevating climate change as a national security um, issue as uh, President Biden's spe special president presidential envoy for climate change. So what is climate security? Uh, for many of you, this might be a, a new topic, especially the, the connection between national security and climate change. And at ASP, we look at um, climate change and national security from several different vantage points. Um, we look at the first order effects of climate change on our national security. So what does that mean? Um, that's the threat that climate change, like rising sea levels, worsening storms, drought, wildfires, 
how those threats um, impact our national security. So at US military installations, both at home and abroad. And we see this um, regularly, uh, especially down south where they're repeatedly getting um, hammered with hurricanes, um, rising seas um, out west with wildfires and drought. And all of this impacts military, our military installations, our readiness and our operations. Um, at ASP, we also look at the role that climate change is playing in instability abroad. Um, all those threats that I just mentioned, natural disasters, drought, et cetera, don't just happen at home, they happen overseas. And in a lot of places that can lead to instability. So the US is often called upon to respond and help with uh, restoring stability to some of those areas. We're also asked to respond to humanitarian um, and disaster relief missions of which the US military does frequently. Um, and so that's change, climate change is changing the type of operations that our military is responding to. I first came to climate change and uh, national security um, after my, my tour in Afghanistan where I was regularly getting briefed from the military about the threat that the uh, decade-long drought in central Afghanistan was posing to U.S. national security interests and obviously our Afghan uh, partners. The drought was pushing vulnerable Afghans off of their, their land and into Taliban-controlled areas, which was certainly undermining the Af Afghan government's national security interests and undermining the U.S. mission there. And it's how I came to be interested in this topic of climate security. And finally, at the American Security Project, we also look at the strategic implications of climate change. The role climate change is playing in great power competition. Many people think about the Arctic uh, when they think about climate change and great power competition, and that is certainly an area where you see these two issues coming together, but it goes beyond that as well. Um, it, it's clean energy competition. It's um, competition for leadership and the ability to exert influence in the international community and how the US's lack of leadership in recent times has been has impacted our ability to exert influence in the future. And while this administration and Secretary Kerry are trying to um, reposition the US as a leader on climate change so that we're able to exert influence in areas of other national security interest, um, it certainly is something that we need to keep in mind when we think about climate change and national security. Um, so the panel's distinguished speakers have years of experience and they'll go into each of these topics in a bit more detail. Um, and we're thrilled to have them with us today. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the American Security Project and uh, climate change and national security, please visit americansecurityproject.org. There are a number of resources on there um, and we hold events like this one regularly. So if you'd like to tune into future events, uh, you can follow us on Twitter at at, um, at AMSEC um, project, and um, that'll help you keep up to date with all of our events. And with that, I won't take up any more time from our uh, distinguished panelists, and I'll turn it back over to Dr. Roth. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alex, uh, for that uh, very informative overview of uh, ASP and the great uh, important work that uh, you all do every day. Uh, so, um, I'm going to hold off just another minute uh, before introducing our first panelists because our distinguished senators from the state of West Virginia, uh, Joe Manchin and Shelley Moore Capito, um, also want to share some, uh, some words of wisdom and uh, insights on this important topic. So we're going to segue uh, to some video recording. Uh, they're uh, busy folks, as we all know, so they weren't able to join us live, but they did take time to um, share some thoughts with us. Uh, that we in turn want to share with you right now. Uh, so please um, uh, stay tuned for the video and then we'll be right back with you. Hello and thank you Marty for inviting me to participate in this event focused on the impact of climate change to our national security. This topic is a broad one because climate change is seen and felt literally all over the map and the impacts vary from region to region making adapting to the changes very localized. The military has been planning for impacts to physical national security infrastructure for years now. Sea level rise threatens numerous bases and other critical infrastructure that cannot be easily relocated. And the effects of climate change are likely to worsen instability around the world, which put American interest at risk. These same effects will increase the chances of conflict and the needs for humanitarian assistance which increases the burden on U.S. forces worldwide.
These are very serious risks to military readiness and operations. In addition, we have risks to consider here at home. Risks associated with our ability to maintain our energy independence, the reliability and resilience of our energy systems, and our economic competitiveness all of which fundamentally underpin American prosperity for current and future generations. As chairman of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee and a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, my top priority this Congress is ensuring the committees work together to identify and enact solutions to both present and future issues facing our country. We have our work cut out for us, but we also have a track record of bipartisanship and the pragmatism that helped us enact the first comprehensive energy bill in 13 years in December of last year. It invested billions of dollars in advancing critical energy technologies, including energy efficiency, renewable energy and grid modernization, energy storage, advanced nuclear and carbon capture utilization and sequestration. That omnibus bill also included a bipartisan compromise to phase out hydrofluorocarbons, greenhouse gases with extremely high warming potential. These were all substantial steps to address climate change done in a bipartisan way. And it is a type of progress that we can make if we take an all of the above approach to energy policy and work together to get these critical climate solutions deployed like carbon capture technologies. And when we talk about climate, it's important to be clear that it's the global climate, not the United States or North American climate, we need these climate solutions to be deployed domestically, but also around the world to make real progress on emissions. That's because while fossil fuel consumption is dropping in the US power grid, the global trends show that fossil fuels aren't going anywhere anytime soon, particularly in countries that are seeking to expand access to electricity and energy in order to address poverty. The International Energy Agency predicts that up to 51% of China's power could come from fossil fuels in 2040, depending on energy policies that are adopted. That number could be as high as 57% for India. That is why we cannot eliminate our way out of climate change. We need all of our options on the table to invest in innovative solutions for the clean use of fossil energy in the electric, industrial, and transportation sectors quickly. I'm all for continuing to make progress decarbonizing our energy systems, but we must do it with an eye to balancing the cost of electricity reliability and resilience with affordability. And we must also advance this energy transition in a way that does not leave hardworking Americans and traditional energy states behind. I truly believe the power of innovation combined with keeping all of our options on the table will help us create high quality jobs. It'll reach our environmental goals and maintain our national security and do so cost effectively. I am truly optimistic about our country's ability to innovate and implement climate change solutions because we fundamentally share these goals and have the know-how to tackle them together. Thank you again for inviting me to be here with you and God bless each and every one of you. Well, hello everyone. Uh, this is your Senator, Shelley Moore Capito. I'd like to thank the University of Charleston and the American Security Project for inviting me to address you today. And I'd like to thank my friend, Marty Roth, for asking me to participate. Although it may not be obvious, there are many ways that environmental policy and national security overlap and impact one another. One area where the two intersect, which is becoming a very hot topic in Congress these days, is the need to decrease our dependence upon adversaries like China for our rare earth elements, otherwise known as REEs. REEs play a crucial role for both everyday technology, like your phone, and equipment utilized by our nation's military. Last December, Congress came together, which we do do, we do come together, to pass the National Defense Authorization Act, which we call the NDAA. This legislation included language that I championed that strongly encourages the DOD, the Department of Defense, to submit a report to Congress assessing the domestic supply chain of REEs and how the department plans to stockpile these elements. By turning the focus on these elements in our country, we will not only limit our reliance on importing these metals from adversaries, but also clean up 
abandoned mines. As it turns out, researchers in West Virginia and throughout Appalachia have found ways to extract REEs from acid mine drainage. By doing this, we can work to benefit our environment, clean up our drainage left by coal mining in our state, while bolstering our national security. Additionally, I have led the way in encouraging both the DOD and the EPA to aggressively Im implement PFOS standards to regulate the chemicals in our drinking water. Very important to me. I've also introduced several pieces of legislation that reduce and regulate the level of dangerous chemicals in our drinking water that was also passed as part of the NDAA. Now, in regards to our reducing our dependence on adversaries, the Nord Stream 2 national, natural gas pipeline in Europe poses a significant threat. A Russian state-owned company has a majority stake in this pipeline, which would transport natural gas from Russia to Germany via the Baltic Sea. I've worked with my colleagues in the Senate to impose sanctions on companies constructing this natural gas pipeline in an effort to limit our European allies' reliance on energy produced by Russia. If completed, the pipeline would make American allies and partners in Europe more susceptible to Russia's co coercion and influence. I have joined my colleagues to introduce legislation to expedite the natural gas export permit approval process for countries in good standing with the United States. This would promote trade and security between our countries and our allies, reducing the need to rely on our adversaries. Additionally, I have been a strong advocate in the Senate for the advancement of carbon capture technology. Just last month, I introduced a bipartisan bill to promote carbon capture utilization. The United States has an opportunity to be a leader here when it comes to carbon capture technologies and this legislation will help us achieve these goals. Carbon capture technology promotes domestic energy production while also reducing our power and manufacturing sector emissions. This is crucial in our goal to remain energy independent. Climate change, energy production, and national security all play major roles in the future of our country. I encourage you to get involved and learn about all of these matters. And again, thank you for giving me the chance to address you today. Well, we're very grateful for Senators uh, Manchin and Capito uh, providing those insightful remarks. Um, I think three themes uh, that resonated throughout both of their uh, discussions um, are knower things that our panelists will focus on. Um, during their discussions today. One is that this is clearly a global phenomenon. And while we have a vested interest in security from a, a local, a state, and a national level, uh, the issues around climate change and the impact that they have uh, are, typical, are, are just simply ones that span the globe. Uh, the second is um, how important innovation is uh, to um, where we're going to land on these important issues. Um, you probably can't think of an area where there's um, kind of more research and development uh, being undertaken than in the field of um, um, energy and uh, issues around climate change. And therefore, there's a domino effect on how those innovations will impact uh, security related issues. And then the third is how all of this ends up touching the end user the final customer. And we're always thinking about issues around access and affordability and so forth. And what are the costs associated with providing access and affordability for the individual user, the individual consumer of energy? And then what's the impact gonna be on the affordability, the access, and ultimately the cost of security issues given the access that we provided to, uh, to individuals with uh, different types of energy solutions. So um, very complex issues, very interesting issues and exciting ones. Uh, so let's get going and start uh, hearing from our panelists. So first, I'm excited to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. John Barnett. Uh, John is a retired um, Major General from the West Virginia National Guard, uh, and he currently serves as the Associate Dean uh, of the School of Business and Leadership uh, here at UC. Uh, before his military retirement, after serving 44 years, he served in a dole hat position as a West Virginia Army National Guard's commander for 15 years and as chief of staff for the 8th United States Army in Korea. 
In his command role, John served as a task force commander for 75 FEMA declared national disasters, including having significant command responsibilities following hurricanes Katrina and Rita. Today, John will be discussing the direct and indirect consequences of climate change with the implications for national security and the Department of Defense. He will also address the requisite leadership skills and competencies required for these complexities. John, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Marty. And, and before I begin my presentation, uh, Dave, if you'd bring that uh, special slide up. We have a, uh, quite an event today. We're all just a happy family here at UC. <laughs> so happy birthday, Marty. Uh, thanks for spending your birthday with us. Nowhere else I'd rather be. <laughs> Thank you. Dave, if you'd go to the slides, please. Thank you. Uh, and thank uh, all the attendees uh, for being with us today and for allowing me to share my thoughts and observations about the uh, implications of climate change on national security and to offer reflections for leaders and leadership as the complex issue is addressed by the DOD community and other significant players. Uh, the slide depicts uh, the uh, direct and the indirect uh, consequences along with the implications uh, that are uh, uh, apparent. Uh, it's evident that climate change will be an integral factor in our response to national security. This was uh, reflected most recently by Secretary of Defense Austin's statement in January of this year when he stated the department will take immediately uh, policy actions to pri prioritize climate change considerations in our activities and risk assessments to mitigate this driver of insecurity. As directed by the president, we will inc include the security implications of climate change in our risk analysis in strategy development and in our planning guidance. As a leader in the interagency, the Department of Defense will also incorporate climate risk analysis into modeling, simulation, war gaming, and the next national defense strategy. Uh, although the recent proclamation gives additional prominence, the efforts of the D DOD in this regard are not new. For example, the DOD spent $67 million in 2020 to protect uh, bases and infrastructure from the effects of climate change. The slides uh, that you see depict the approach from a general perspective of what, so what, and, and now what. Uh, the first two columns on the slide uh, depict uh, effects where various uh, documented evidence and general agreement exist. And so these two columns predict the what of the climate change factors. The national security and D DOD implications reflect the so what of the matter, as well as demonstrate the complexity of the issue. Admiral White and General Devereux will address in more detail selected issues which also serve as an indication of the complexity and importance of the issue. Uh, Dave, if you would go to slide two. Slide two, uh, as well as slide three, uh, depicts the now what of the, paradigm, of the paradigm, and I think have implications for how we develop leaders and leadership as we address climate change and national security uh, now and in the future. As the slides indicate, national, uh, climate change and national security is best understood through a complexity lens. Uh, for example, the climate change factors of rising sea levels resulting in sea surge and warm water temperatures resulting in heavy and prolonged rain uh, join with other forces to create a perfect storm resulting in the worst national disaster in a nation's history, Hurricane Katrina. The other documented factors 
adding to the complexity include failed leadership at every level, poor and faulty planning. Uh, the planning was mostly focused on history and experience and not, not on what if scenarios. Uh, also, there was eroded and poorly maintained infrastructure, in, including the, the levees and the drainage pumps uh, in and around New Orleans. And sadly to say, instances of graft and corruption. My participation in the aftermath of Katrina provided an, op an opportunity to observe and participate in complexity leadership firsthand. At the onset of uh, Katrina, I was in Korea and I was called uh, and asked if I could come home and take a group of West Virginia soldiers to help with recover recovery efforts as the Louisiana Guard had suffered uh, major personal losses and equipment uh, failures. The mission we were given uh, simply was to send as many people as quickly as possible to help in any way possible. All other states were given the same mission. So in three or four days, 42,000 members of the National Guard from all 50 states arrived at Bell Chase Naval Station in New Orleans. When I arrived there, <coughs> I found there was no mission, no organization, no infrastructure, no means of communication, having only food and water for the troops for three days, but thousands of soldiers uh, and airmen willing and able to help uh, in any way they could. Out of this uh, catastrophic situation, I found some excellent examples of complexity leadership and many, many lessons learned. I also observed uh, several examples, many examples uh, of heroic leadership, including fighter pilots serving as air traffic controllers. They were uh, successful in operating the largest military airlift since World War II without any loss of life. I also observed the Coast Guard performing over 14,000 rooftop rescues without a single accident. Out of the chaos on the ground, we created and implemented an organizational and command structure and a response plan almost overnight. In the following days, we added necessary short and long range planning sales to the organization. We also conducted organizational planning while operating for RITA, which occurred 30 days after Katrina. This was done despite the, the situational uh, failures that I mentioned early. The other climate change uh, factors uh, depicted in slide one, uh, such as drought and the thawing in the Arctic region, present other examples of uh, climate change uh, examples of the magnitude and complexity we faced in uh, Katrina and beyond. Uh, it certainly puts our national security at risk. Katrina, uh, interestingly, also demonstrated the effects of, uh, of small changes resulting in, temp in a tipping point, which is a characteristic of complexity theory. Simply put, a, a category three hurricane turning into a catastrophic event simply by uh, additional uh, warming of the, of the ocean, uh, and again, uh, the resulting in, in the sea surge, uh, and also in the warming temperature resulting in heavy and prolonged rain. Uh, I believe looking at uh, these complex issues from a command and control perspective, as uh, some are considering, may obscure the dynamics of the context and actually contribute to a worsening of the disaster or uh, catastrophe. Uh, Dave, if you'd go to slide three. <clears throat> Through a complexity lens, both uh, leaders and leadership uh, development uh, are approached differently than traditionally so. Uh, complexity requires focus upon the fluid and dynamic exchange between people, systems, and events. Complexity also requires a shift in thinking from the view of building competency defined as the basic knowledge and skills to perform a task or a job to a view of developing capability 
which integrates knowledge and skill with adaptability, flexibility, and versatility to meet the evolving needs while still appreciating and valuing the importance of people. The complexity lens shifts leader behavior to a process or an approach. For instance, judgment in these situations is not seen as a single call, but as a, as a process of learning <clears throat> and decision-making and action. The task on the slide depict the elements in an ongoing cycle. Although not shown on the slides, redo loops and an understanding that learning must occur both from success and failure. Uh, again, uh, the complexity lens, I think, is uh, one that must be used as we address the uh, evolving and expanding issues of climate change and national security. Uh, thank you again for allowing me the opportunity to speak to today. And Dr. Roth, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, John, for sharing your experiences, your literally firsthand uh, dealing with some of the um, you know, major kind of weather-related catastrophes of our time um, and the insights uh, that you took away from those that I know that you impart on our leadership students uh, each and every day. Appreciate your sharing them with our audience. So just as a reminder, if you would like to um, ask any questions of any of our panelists, uh, please submit them through the chat function, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, and we'll be happy to entertain those um, so after we've had an opportunity to hear from each of our panelists. <clears throat> it's now my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. George Walker, uh, a retired nuclear physicist. And uh, once again, fortunate for us here at UC, uh, has been actively involved in our leadership programs, in particular, our doctorate of executive leadership. Uh, so Dr. Walker is a senior mentor in the Doctorate in Executive Leadership Program at UC, also serving as a senior advisor for academic analytics. He's a retired professor of physics at Indiana University and former vice president for research and dean of the Graduate School of Indiana University, Florida International University, Cleveland State University. So he's definitely kind of made the rounds in the academic circuit. Uh, he's the former senior scholar at the Carnegie Foundation, former consultant and member and chair of advising committees at Livermore and Los Alamos National Laboratories. Uh, so Dr. Walker has been in the thick of things for um, uh, quite some time. Uh, he will discuss with us today the ongoing challenges of performance of high-tech components, communication, and domestic infrastructure vulnerability because of the threat multiplying effects of climate change. Dr. Walker. Thank you, President Roth. So uh, climate uh, change is both a multiplier and amplifier of, uh, of threats. And what I'm gonna talk about, I hope will be a little complimentary to what some of the other panelists will talk about. As a scientist, uh, early in my career, I was uh, involved in quality control, uh, making sure that the uh, parts that were supplied by uh, commercial dealers to the military uh, met the specifications. Uh, and that's still an ongoing problem. Uh, climate change will make the turbulence, the uh, temperature variations, uh, the um, general terrible situation that, that individual component parts, whether it's computer type parts, uh, trigger amplifier cards, we would call them in the older days, various things. And, and so one of the things that I found when I was testing these things that the technology that the uh, military relies on is that at the extreme ends, temperatures of over 150, 200 degrees, uh, below, below 150 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, at the extremes, most of the things I tested right at the edges where the military had said were the um, areas where they needed these things to be reliable, was where I would flunk about 50% of the component parts that were going to be supplied to the space program and in, and in uh, guided missiles. And uh, so some people in the company said, well, you know, they won't really use it at those extreme temperatures. Why don't you just test it a little lower because we got to get these things out the door. And indeed, if you just go a little bit below the specifications, you can, you can uh, save 95% of the parts. Fortunately, the head of the company said, no, 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 we can't do that. 
We have to make sure that we do what we say we do when we deliver these parts in the extreme conditions where they're going to be used. Although that's a 50 year old issue, uh, when I first started dealing with it, it's still with us. Uh, because of climate change, we will find that one of our great strengths, technology, can also be our Achilles heel if the individual parts don't operate like they're supposed to. And you have to trust people, but you have to make sure that you test in the military, of course, uh, the, the parts, and there has to be uh, really substantial economic sanctions if the parts don't work. You can't wait until something doesn't work uh, under, under fire. As you know, uh, a kingdom was lost because a horseshoe was not, uh, was not adequate. So one of my first uh, uh, concerns is that under the extreme conditions that we'll face, that the individual high-tech parts may not work in some of our high technology. And so what would be a strength can be an Achilles heel. On the other hand, uh, communication is very important. And with the atmosphere having so much energy, whether it uh, uh, be traditional problems associated with wind and rain and, and that kind of thing, or the much more uh, electromagnetic energy that's, that's in the atmosphere, the ways we communicate typically are with electromagnetic radiation, uh, photons. And what happens if the atmosphere is highly charged is those photons get absorbed, re-emitted, get scattered. And so the very things that you depend on at a crucial moment uh, for communication, communication not just with other leaders, but more importantly in some cases, communication with drones or with missiles or with positioning, those things may be at threat. So you have to do ahead of time the, the uh, studies, which, which people do, uh, to make sure that these things will work under extreme conditions. And in fact, there's sometimes you know you're just not going to be able to use a drone. In fact, some of the most important cases where you would like to use a drone is where you won't be able to because you can't control them. And so when you're carrying out um, war games, you have to always, as they do, have a situation where all of your technology and your communication breaks down and what you do in that situation. So both the reliability of parts and the ability to communicate in a high tech situation uh, with, global, uh, with, uh, with uh, global climate change is extremely important. It's an old problem, but it's not a problem that uh, is any less important than it was uh, many, many decades ago. Now, the, the, the final situation I'd like to talk about is the other strength we have. One of our strengths is our science and our technology, but as we've seen, it can be it, it can be our fatal flaw if we don't control it the right way. The other is our people. I'm talking about civilians and in the military, the quality of our people, their loyalty, their training, their intelligence, their team efforts, all of that is extremely, extremely important. And we're very fortunate to have really great people. And I'm particularly thinking now in the military in this regard. But as we know, we're living in a time domestically when many people in our country uh, have lost hope, they have a different worldview than we do. They, they uh, have been either from their point of view, and in, in fact, in many cases, absolutely um, um, forgotten. They've lost hope. And anytime you have a group of people that lose hope, they can easily go astray. Uh, and these people are everywhere in our, in our society. We've seen examples of that in the last few months in, in various situations. So our country is not nearly as united as it once was. And these people who regard themselves as patriots are everywhere in our society. They're in the military, they're outside the military. They've been trained in the military, they're outside now. And they see themselves as the people who can provide opportunities for people who have lost hope. And if I were a, a person that was thinking about that, I would wait until there was a, uh, um, a, a terrible situation where the National Guard may, might be brought in because of climate change. I would then use that opportunity to create havoc uh, by bringing down a grid, by doing various kinds of, of, of guerrilla warfare. And I would do that with the idea of making sure that the American people became more aware that their government leaders, their military could not help them, that they were, uh, should be in fear. 
And once you have a group of people in fear because you've used guerrilla tactics to undermine their confidence, they can, they can then be led astray because I believe people will trade their long-term freedom for short-term safety. So we have to have a situation where we anticipate that and we work with it. Uh, now, the, the, the answer in the back of the book, from my point of view, is that you can only go so far in combating organized uh, guerrilla domestic warfare. You can only go so far in that. The real answer in the back of the book is that we have to reach out, especially in a situation of climate change, not just globally, but internally, we have to find ways to reach out in every way we know with people that we may dislike, that we don't trust, that may have been very bad to us, that have a, a very different worldview than us. We have to find common cause in situations where we can work together because otherwise we all stand to lose the most important thing we have, which is our freedom. Freedom is like a, a monolith, a, a, a rock, a very heavy rock standing up. And it's waving in the wind now because of all the issues we have. If that monolith falls to the ground, it will be impossible in a short period of time to lift it up. And there will be people who will promise during times of global climate change that they can protect and help us just to gain power. We have to be able to anticipate that, work with people and reach out so that when um, a hurricane comes along and right in the middle of it, the grid goes down because of mischievous acts domestically, people will understand that we're all in this together and we have to work together as opposed to being disunited, a house that falls. That's one of my great concerns about national security in a time uh, of divisiveness within our country. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, President Roth. Thank you, Dr. Walker. Uh, it's interesting that you kind of reinforced uh, one of the uh, key leadership themes from Dr. Barnett, that being communication, um, but also in so doing, um, kind of recognizing some of the uh, not only operational challenges with communications, but uh, some of the risks associated with uh, bad actors or individuals with uh, disparate uh, viewpoints uh, utilizing uh, their own communication strategies uh, to try to uh, undermine activities. Uh, so definitely an important theme that we need to keep in mind. Uh, let me, um, <clears throat> excuse me, let me once again remind everybody if you'd like to uh, pose a question, uh, to any of the panelists, uh, please do, throw th do so through the chat feature. Uh, we're doing very good on time here. We have two more panelists, uh, so I think we should have plenty of time for uh, Q&A um, at the end. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce Michael White. Uh, Mike is a doctoral student here at the University of Charleston, uh, studying in our Doctor of Executive Leadership program. Um, and he retired from the Navy as a rear admiral after 34 years of service in the US Navy. Uh, today, he will discuss rising seas and the compounding challenge of infrastructure, weather, and environmentally displaced people. Mike? Dr. Roth, thanks very much. And uh, what a privilege to be here today and, and on this distinguished panel. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes to give you a maritime perspective on, on many of the topics we've already talked about today that, that Alex and Dr. Roth, Dr. Barnett, Dr. Walker have all already introduced us to. So hopefully be able to give you a, just maybe a nuance or a different perspective that we haven't thought about. So as we uh, think about rising seas as part of climate change, there is a compounding effect on preserving the ready and capable maritime forces while considering the potential increased demand signal for those same forces. So we'll start with readiness. And we often talk about readiness as a combined effort to equip, train, and man the platform. So I'll take a look at those in, in a bit more depth. The picture you see on the upper left is Naval Station, Norfolk, Virginia, one of our largest Navy facilities and home to many ships, aircraft, and submarines. So your first thought may be that a ship will certainly keep floating on a higher sea, which is absolutely true. But eventually that ship needs to merge with land to dock for food, fuel, people, other supplies. And that intersection of land and sea is where the rising seas can have a huge impact. In fact, there was a 2019 DOD study on the effects of climate change uh, where they found 16 major Navy installations were considered vulnerable 
to recurring flooding due to rising seas. It was an interesting side note, it was another 18 installations were considered vulnerable to drought, which you don't normally consider with the Navy. But drought carries its own unique uh, characteristics like limiting training activity due to high heat indexes. But uh, we'll, we'll get back to flooding, my purpose today. Joint Base Langley Eustace, which is just a few miles from the Norfolk Naval Station, has seen a 14 inch sea level rise since 1930 due to localized land subsidence and rising seas. And that's led to more recurring flooding. Now, I think you can easily visualize the effects of flooding in an industrial area like the ship's beards. Protecting an infrastructure like the power distribution, the cranes, the other heavy equipment that operates on those piers and the piers themselves is necessary. And something else to consider, the flooding might be elsewhere in the installation, impacting the way you move materials, ordnance, food, and other things to those ships. So in the equipped part of the readiness equation, having a secure place to do the five R's as we call them, repair, rearm, refuel, revive, and reload is necessary. Rising seas is going to complicate that effort, as we've been discussing. What about training? I mentioned that the drought part of climate change may increase the sustained high temperatures, which impacts outdoor training, outdoor training without the proper acclimation. But something else you may not consider are the training ranges themselves. Uh, just last month, the Marine Corps discussed a study of the shoreline of a training range in Hawaii that is being reduced due to sea level rise. The study predicted a loss of anywhere from two to 19 feet of shoreline, which reduces the usable area, erodes the berms, allows seawater intrusion into the ranges, making them unusable. Now, this is a single example, but I think you can imagine the competition for usable shorelines with rising seas. It's only gonna increase and the loss of a training range may not be easy to replace. So just, uh, that's a note on the training part of the equation. What about the manning part? So in the upper right, there's a photo from Naval Support Activity Mid-South. It's in Millington, Tennessee. I was stationed there in 2010 when this photo was taken. It was a 100-year flood event, as it was termed. Now, Millington supports the Navy's personnel and recruiting commands, which is office work. The Red Star is the building where I happen to work. And I want to use this photo to highlight another issue with flooding, and that's the human impact. Now, of course, the buildings were a mess after the flood. It took considerable effort to reconstitute the production after the floodwaters receded. But those same floodwaters were in the homes of many of our sailors. Someone who's dealing with this kind of destruction to their homes, taking care of their family and their property is not a productive member of the team at that time, and, and rightfully so. So as you consider the impacts of recurring flooding on an installation, you've also got to think about all those workforces living in the local area, in those same flood zones. So while Millington, Tennessee is not a great example of a rising sea, uh, it was a personal impact that I had that I witnessed and it showed me you know, the impacts I could have on the day-to-day -day manning and, and the work of an organization. So as you think about the three of those on equip, train, and man, rising seas can affect all of them. Now, certainly there's an awareness of these challenges, but a lot's being done in some unique ways you may not have heard of. At Joint Base Lange Utsis, there was a modeling system that was developed to predict the flood prone areas under different conditions. And the insulation could then target door dams where they could be needed and allowed them to reduce the number of sandbags required by 70% when they expected a flood event. That's a lot of manpower and time you save without sandbags. Another really interesting example down in Florida, uh, Eglin and MacDill Air Force Bases partnered with some local groups uh, because they were suffering from coastal erosion. Uh, they used oyster shells collected from restaurants to set a foundation for oyster reefs and create a living shoreline that's more stable and, and creates some natural protection. Uh, in Hawaii, the Marine Corps training range I mentioned, uh, they're going to revegetate the land between the range and the high water mark of the shore and, and move the range farther inland potentially. And with regard to people, a lot of installations and communities are partnering together to look at these challenges. Here in Newport, Rhode Island, where I live, there's an active study going on with our local community, civic and uh, government leaders, uh, the leadership from the Naval Station, and also some uh, gaming and uh, modeling experts uh, from a couple of local universities. And so together, this group is coming together to try to identify uh, not only the pure mili military readiness aspect of the, the station itself, but the local community as well. Because uh, as I've tried to demonstrate to you, it's, it's all connected. And this is one of a many such efforts. So let me shift briefly now and, and look at the demands on these same maritime forces, which could grow due to climate change and rising seas. Down on the lower left is a photo of Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines in 2013. 
Many of you remember it was the largest typhoon in recent history, and it was devastating to the Philippine Islands. Philippines actually have a very robust and excellent humanitarian assistance disaster recovery force, but it was overwhelmed by the magnitude of the storm. You may also recall there was a large U.S. presence. And it was an international response. The U.S. played a, a strong role. We actually had an aircraft carrier strike group and a marine expeditionary force uh, both deployed to the area for an extended period of time to help the Philippine armed forces and the Philippine government. The, the, there's an expectation that storms will increase in frequency. We've heard that from a number of our, our speakers today. And the strength of those storms increases as well. So that could require more humanitarian assistance. Uh, humanitarian assistance is, is a critical mission. It strengthens relationships with partners, improves our interoperability, but it's not the primal, primary purpose of our naval forces, who now may be pulled between those competing demands of combat readiness and supporting humanitarian assistance events. And, and finally, in the lower right is a photo of people who've been environmentally displaced. In a World Bank report from 2018, the researchers predict that if climate change continues on the current vector, 143 million people will be displaced from their homes by 2050 in Sub-Saharan Africa, South, America, South Asia, and Latin America. That's about 2.8% of the population in those areas. Now, the number may not be exactly correct, but it certainly points to the magnitude of the problem from environmental displacement. So an outgrowth of displaced people is the instability and tension between nations who are receiving large numbers of displaced persons. Some of you may recall Operation Sophia, this was a European Union operation between navies in the area, started in 2015 to manage the migrants coming from Northern Africa across the Mediterranean due to failed governments, failed economies, and environmental displacement. Now, while this operation was very successful, there was considerable tension, you may recall, among the, these very friendly European nations on how they were going to deal with the migrants coming in. If this were an issue between less friendly nations or neighbors, you know, instability, could emerge and regional security declines. And depending on the region, the presence of military forces may be required to maintain security and free and open seas for trade. So another demand signal may come from the climate change on those same forces looking to be ready. So I've, I've tried to describe to you the compounding effect of pressures on readiness and the growing demand for the forces. I, I hope it didn't come across as overly pessimistic because that certainly isn't the intent. As other panelists have, have described, you know, daunting challenges to be sure, but organizations and communities truly are studying, discussing, and proposing unique solutions, and uh, it gives me confidence. So I hope it's provided you with maybe some new ideas or at least some nuances to things you've already considered uh, about rising seas and climate change. Dr. Roth, thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Absolutely. Thanks, Mike. Uh, your uh, remarks remind me of the old saying, um, a rising tide raises all ships. Well, a rising tide has certainly other consequences that we often don't think about. So we appreciate your uh, shedding some light on them for us. Um, our fourth panelist is uh, Major General Rick Devereaux, uh, retired from the United States Air Force. Uh, Major General uh, Devereaux was the commander of the Air Force Expeditionary Center at Fort Dix, New Jersey and the Director of Operational Planning, Policy, and Strategy at the Pentagon. Since leaving the military in 2012, he has worked as a consultant in the energy industry and on climate security issues with Citizens Climate Lobby, the Center for Climate and Security, and the ASP, our co-sponsor today. Today, he'll be discussing the national security imperative of moving away from fossil fuels and how this relates to an emerging clean energy technology arms race with China. Major Devereaux. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roth. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. And uh, I'm, I'm honored to bat cleanup on this uh, distinguished panel. Uh, we've heard some really great points regarding the impact of climate change on our national security. Uh, and I think we'd probably all agree that obviously anything our nation and world can do to reduce our carbon footprint will help reduce these impacts. And of course, the U.S. military wants to do its part as well. But at the end of the day, I would argue that DOD's energy policy is going to be driven not so much by climate change or environmental concerns, but what will enhance our military capability and the operational effectiveness of our fighting forces. So, uh, so that's kind of why our military is leading the charge towards renewable energy technologies. 
to buy to provide uh, better security for the nation. And uh, let, let me make a couple underlying points in that regard. First off, uh, our military's use of fossil fuels is very expensive. You know, we spend billions of dollars per year, not just consuming, but also safeguarding uh, the passage of those fossil fuels into our free markets. Uh, you know, the military needs uh, fuel for power projections, for its ships, its vehicles, its aircraft. Uh, and we use a lot of it. If, if the Department of Defense were a country, our oil use would rank as the number 34, number th yeah, 34 country in the world. Uh, and we spend a lot more resources ensuring those oil and natural gas supply lines are not disrupted. Uh, it's a fact that about a third of oil, the uh, refined oil flows through strategic choke points in places like the Straits of Hormuz, uh, the uh, Malacan Straits, our United States Navy has to uh, patrol those sea lanes to ensure uh, the free flow of oil. And so our, our military is burdened with that responsibility, as well as we know for, for the past several decades, we've been drawn to conflicts in the Middle East in large measure to ensure that we uh, get, uh, preserve access to that resource. And we're talking about today issues in the South China, South China Sea, the Arctic, other places where fossil fuels are present. Uh, you know, the other aspect about fossil fuels that's a bit of a burden for our military is the fact that the supply lines that we rely on are often vulnerable. And those supply lines can generate uh, casualties to our forces. Our former Secretary of Defense, General Mattis, once said that the military needs to work harder to unleash itself from what he called the tether of fuel. You know, it's, it's challenging oftentimes to get fuel to the front lines of our expeditionary operations, our forward operating bases. We're often dependent on foreign countries to provide a supply of fuels for our forces and fragile logistical networks. Afghanistan was a great example of that. It's some of our remote bases there. It costs as much as $400 a gallon to get fuel forward to the troops that needed it. And the, you know, extending and protecting those kinds of logistics lines can be a big source of casualties. And unfortunately, we saw that in Iraq and Afghanistan, where about a third of our casualties came from IED attacks against logistical supply lines, much of which carried fuel. In Afghanistan, about one out of every 24 fuel convoys came under an uh, attack that generated a US casualty. So these are the kind of operational reasons that the United States military is wanting to go green, to move towards more renewable energy technologies that have less vulnerabilities on the battlefield. You know, things like solar and wind power combined with battery technologies can provide light, resilient energy sources for expeditionary operations, replacing diesel, uh, very heavy and uh, logistically tethered diesel power generators. The military is also working on things like hybrid electric motors to increase the efficiency and reduce the fossil fuel requirements for vehicles, ships, and aircraft. And even here in the United States, at our uh, continental bases, we're installing solar panels, wind farms, biodiesel generation plants in order to, to cut the cord, if you will, from vulnerable civilian power grids, you know, like we saw in Texas this winter. So it's, it's really for these operational reasons that our national security establishment is moving uh, towards adopting more green renewable uh, energy technologies. And it really makes sense to do this because we want our military to be effective in countering potential threats from our adversaries, adversaries like China, for instance. But when we say uh, China, for instance, sometimes our national strategy and our rhetoric can get confused when we start talking about adversaries like China and climate change and renewable energy technology. You know, we, we often hear things like 
since China uh, more than doubles the total US carbon footprint, then we shouldn't get duped into making concessions or cooperating with China or moving too rapidly towards renewables because this will hurt our jobs and hurt our economy. Uh, I've even heard people say, uh, if you're a real China hawk, then you can't be a climate hawk. But I, I think about this in, a, in terms of another reality. And that reality is that China is rapidly outpacing the US in developing and scaling new renewable energy technologies, not only to address its own internal environmental issues, but as a way to control resources, gain allies and reduce US economic and political influence around the globe. So to put it bluntly, I think the US's risk to fall behind in what, what I term a re renewable energy technology race, and that's hurting our national security. So I would argue we need to update our national security strategy, strategy to address how we can effectively compete with China in this arena in order to protect our interests and promote our own uh, national security. So let, let me show you a, a few examples of, uh, of how China is advancing its, its interests in this area. Uh, China is, is uh, moving out when it comes to renewable energy technology. They're the largest employer of solar wind and hydro generation in the world. Uh, in fact, the country of China is responsible for adding one half of the world's new renewable energy each year. They produce 70% of uh, solar panels globally. The US produces 1%. China produces one third of wind power around the world. Uh, six of the top 10 wind turbine companies are Chinese companies. China is the world's unrivaled leader in electric vehicle manufacturing. They build over half of the world's EVs each year. And those companies are often supported through billions of dollars of state funds, not just free enterprise. Uh, China produces the bulk of the magnets found in electric vehicle motors, and they're responsible for the assembly of those motors. Bottom line is you cannot make an electric vehicle without China today. And when it comes to batteries, uh, they're also very dominant. They produce 77% of the world's lithium ion batteries. Uh, even Tesla's former vice president for battery production said, China controls the cards in the battery supply chain. And as part of its Belt and Road Initiative, China now dominates and controls the world supply chains for battery productions and other materials critical to renewable energy technologies. Uh, you can see on the slide there that China controls about 75% of global chemical cobalt refining. Cobalt, by the way, is essential for battery manufacturing. And they control over half of the cobalt mining operations in the Democratic Republic of, of the Congo and other third world nations. They have mining interest in terms of copper mines uh, around the world that are essential for electric motors, batteries, and wind terminants. They're dominant in other rare earth mineral supply chains, including polysilicon, which is used in solar panels. And finally, China is the, the world's leader in long distance high voltage power grid networks. Uh, they just uh, completed a 1600 kilometer line across the center of their country. And these, these networks are critical to move power from uh, renewable uh, technology sources like solar and wind to cities uh, where they can use that power. So bottom line here is I would argue from a national security perspective, the US is behind and we need to work hard to catch up and expand our renewable energy technology supply chains. The good news is this is doable. Uh, it's just gonna take some investment, some strategic public and private partnership, uh, investment in clean energy technology, uh, that's going to create job opportunities for Americans in the clean energy sector. It's going to make our companies more competitive. 
It's gonna reduce our carbon emissions. And more, most importantly, I think it's gonna offer other countries an alternative to the China dominated renewable energy market that's out there today. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a good opportunity to step up and as suggested by Dr. Walker, perhaps an area that we can find common, common cause with Americans that really wanna uh, put America's national security up front. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Rick, we appreciate your comments. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to uh, reshare their cameras, uh, their video, and uh, we'll segue into some Q&A. Um, the first question or request that popped up was to reshow the first slide uh, from Dr. Barnett uh, showing the realities of climate change and different consequences. So I asked Dave Traub to um, show that slide. But I will also mention uh, to the audience that this entire session is being recorded and we will be happy to uh, share a link to the recording um, with all of the participants today. So you will certainly have opportunities to go back and um, observe any of the slides or uh, listen to any of the presentations or certainly uh, the Q&A, which we're about to uh, embark into. Uh, so um, I know Midge had asked that we uh, share the slides, so we're happy to do that. Um, I'm gonna first jump into some of the um, questions that were submitted in the Q&A area, and then we'll shift over to the, uh, to the chat area uh, where others have submitted uh, questions or observations. Um, so our first uh, question in the Q&A is that many people talk about the need to reach out to those uh, who disagree or who create issues from disaster situations uh, such that uh, Dr. Walker mentioned. Uh, but seldom are options, suggestions, or approaches detailed. Um, so I open this up to uh, Dr. Walker and any of the panelists, uh, suggestions on how we can uh, do better with regard to our uh, communications regarding these issues with uh, you know, different important stakeholder groups. Uh, thank you, President Roth. Well, the first thing, of course, is to really understand where people who disagree with us are coming from. We really need to understand their needs. Uh, there are very few uh, ideas that people have that don't have within them a kernel of important truth. And we need to uh, you know, understand that. So before we imagine that we're going to talk with someone and perhaps convince them of something, we need to understand where they're coming from and what it is that they really need that we could help with. Because there's always something. The second is, I, I, I don't know if it was Mark Twain, uh, some sage um, made the quote that it's not the things we don't know that really wipe us out. It's the things we think we know and are wrong about that, that really hurt us. And my experience is for all of us, for, well, for, except for all of you here, all of us, there's something important that we hold dear, that we are absolutely convinced is right, and we are wrong about. We, there, there's something that we hold dear that we are wrong about. And I've, I've had that situation several times. Uh, and it, if you've never had it happen, maybe it's because you, you haven't been tested enough on these things. So if that's true, that means that when we go in and talk to other people who have a different opinion than us, it could be us that uh, at least has the blinders on. So we have to first know what the issues are. And we have to go in with the humility that it's not us taking the truth to everyone. It's a common ground. And then you when you go in and talk with people, so... Uh, we all have different personalities. But what's worked for me is if you have those two ideas in mind and then you go in and spend time with people and find area where there is common cause and every once in a while I'll say, ah, I didn't realize that, yeah. Uh, you begin to build a little credibility. You don't do it overnight, but you begin to build a little credibility and you can become a fellow human being with other folks and begin to have areas where you can make a little bit of an impression on them in ways that broaden their own horizons, uh, but you can't do it quickly and you can't do it by being a mental bully. Thank you, Dr. Walker, for expanding on that. Um, uh, uh, great suggestions and recommendations. Uh, we have another question, which I think is a, um, a, a little bit, uh, certainly important and, and related to our discussion today, but 
uh, perhaps um, our subject matter experts are not um, kind of on the um, science side of environmentalism, but nonetheless, I'll see if anybody would like to um, share an observation on how important it is um, to put a fee on carbon in combating climate change. I don't know if any of our panelists have given that any thought, if it's something that they would like to uh, um, weigh in on. Dr. Roth, I'd be happy to, to say a, a, a bit about that. Uh, yeah, I work with an organization called Citizens Climate Lobby that's very much in favor of, uh, of putting a fee or carbon pricing uh, to, in order to generate what they say would be a free market kind of activity that would support the development of renewable energy technologies. Uh, so, you know, that's part of the problem, right, with fossil fuels is that we all get to benefit from its use and its relative uh, sort of affordability because we don't have to pay, right, for the damage that it causes our environment or or we, have, we don't have to deal with the impact. So uh, the carbon fee uh, puts that into the equation and then incentivizes alternative technologies. Um, and I, I like this approach because just like this discussion we're having today, the national security aspects of climate change, it provides some common ground. Oftentimes people that are not interested in talking about environmental concerns or the impacts of climate change, their ears perk up when you start talking national security. Or maybe it's someone that's concerned about the loss of US jobs or the impact of our economy of moving too, past, too quickly towards renewables. Their ears perk up if you say, well, economists like the idea of free market solutions to this climate change issue. So I think there's an opportunity for some common ground here in this uh, carbon pricing approach. Uh, great. Thanks so much for uh, diving in on that, Rick. And a kind of a related question that uh, Chester posed in the chat area is that uh, a lot of the comments were uh, devoted to climate change conditions, but not so much on policies or government standards, regulations, and so forth. Um, so in addition to a carbon fee, any other thoughts with regard to um, actions that may be taken related to uh, some of these environmental concerns? So this is, this is Mike White, and perhaps not a great answer, but when uh, Secretary of Defense, you know, signed out uh, the, the policy that the DOD needs to take into account, you know, climate considerations, the discussion was really about, uh, where I was, about uh, innovation. You know, you could get into the endless idea of uh, we put money and make the pier 10 feet taller, and then you realize that you can't get the... Uh, truck to the pier because it's already flooded farther inland and then your people can't get to work and so it becomes this endless uh need of of infrastructure uh, changes to, to achieve one end state which is to, to get a ship to a pier and, and so uh, as we looked uh, and discussed here you know these these combined solutions of the communities i thought the one down in uh in central gulf coast was uh, remarkable using oyster shells from restaurants um it's really got to be a look at uh, at ideas other than putting more money towards uh, what might be the obvious solution. I don't know if that contributes much, I'd offer that. Yeah. Dr. I appreciate Ross, I that. Might, I might add a little bit. Um, I think that, uh, and the, the point I attempted to make earlier is that a top-down command and control approach uh, probably is not best. Uh, it, it, it calls for collaboration uh, at every level. Uh, and, and again, that's uh, people on all sides and. Uh, and, and the skill of empathy, I think, becomes paramount. And I think you saw a difference uh, in uh, the response to Katrina and then to Sandy. Uh, again, both catastrophic events, uh, but handled much differently. And I would argue that uh, certainly there was a, an improvement in planning, but a much higher level of cooperation and collaboration from affected parties. So I think as we move forward in, in addressing these issues that uh, you know, we have to move away from the military mindset of do this, this is the mission to how we're gonna do it. And, and again, how we're gonna do it needs to involve all affected and interested stakeholders and, and uh, partners, if you will. 
President Roth, uh, I have Please. a thought. Uh, one of the reasons that we um, don't uh, utilize biological warfare is because it can turn on you. Uh, and uh, if you try strategies, certain kinds of strategies to encourage something, uh, such as, um, well, vote with your pocketbook. If there are companies that don't do certain things and aren't uh, sensitive to climate change, you don't, uh, you don't buy from them. Well, you have to be careful about that, uh, as we've seen uh, recently with uh, Georgia, uh, that uh, these things uh, are, are two-sided. And so I think that the, the, for me, the challenge is some of these issues of incentives are, it doesn't mean we can't address them, but they're complicated. And it's not as though there's a simple answer in the back of the book for some of these things, because there's always, it's a two-edged sword. It's true, and I agree with uh, uh, General Barnett, uh, top-down doesn't work. Uh, I think a certain number of uh, economic incentives uh, are useful, but we have to be very careful about the economic incentives. As I say, voting with your uh, pocketbook can uh, actually turn on you and be a problem. And perhaps related to that, there's another um, question that Barbara posed in the uh, in the Q and A, and I think even ties back to um, another comment in the chat um, related to some of the comments that our senators made. Is on the one hand, uh, we kind of feel good about touting bipartisanism as a way of recognizing we have two dominant political parties uh, here in the United States, and there are times when those party lines come down and uh, the focus is more on the, uh, the actual issues at hand. Um, but even then, that's making issues polar by saying there's two sides to them. Um, so is there any way for us to, um, in addition to some of the things which have already been uh, suggested, uh, to help uh, try to get us um, away from um, specific viewpoints um, from, from political parties or uh, specific perspectives that um, individuals may have depending on their occupational affiliation uh, to trying to um, kind of get more to the heart of some of these, uh, some of these issues and, and have discussions which are a little um, kind of more, more flexible, more wide ranging, more along a spectrum than opposed to uh, kind of two poles, if you will. I would only say, President Roth, that in science, um, we've uh, made great progress when we had two truths that were clearly uh, di diametrically opposite, it seemed. Is it a particle or is it a wave? The answer is yes, uh, <laughs> it's a wave equal. It's in quantum mechanics. Uh, we are, uh, we are uh, enslaved by our language and we create these uh, false uh, uh, choices sometimes. And sometimes the way out of a difficult situation is to create a new language, to express things in a way that don't already use the language that we have in our minds that create these polar opposites, but allow for a little bit more insight. And so actually to use our creativity in the language we use when we're dealing with certain issues can move us ahead. It certainly did in science. Great, I appreciate your sharing that, um, Dr. Walker. Um, I think you did a great job already um, answering uh, Lance qu Lance's question in the chat. Uh, so let's go to Virginia's, um, complimenting you on the interesting and compelling discussion. Um, and then asking, as we become more aware of the challenge, what about solutions to diminish, diminish the cause of these challenges um, of climate change? Uh, what will be major solutions and uh, what role do you foresee the military having, um, not just with the um, types of activities that we've discussed in, in dealing with uh, the consequences, but um, you know, does the military have a role in uh, trying to um, mitigate uh, some of the problems and uh, reducing some of the consequences from occurring in the first place? You know, I, I'll mention uh, on that one, Dr. Roth, that uh, I think the military does have a big role to play in, in uh, these areas, not just in mitigating the impact of climate change and their operations, as Dr. White uh, pointed out very, very well, but also in, in terms of this public debate that we're sort of talking about right now, because, uh, you know, let's face it, the public 
respects our military and the military leaders. I think they admire the way uh, military folks talk matter of factly about climate change and its impact on installations, on operations, on readiness. And it, it uh, generates this sort of beginning of a conversation that's more comfortable and less, less polarizing. Also, I think, you know, our public has always looked to the military uh, in terms of synergy with technology, defense-related technologies that can be used for public good. And I think, you know, as, as I pointed out in some of my remarks, you know, a lot of these renewable green technologies, the military is developing not just to be good as citizens and good stewards, but is because they work and they're operationally much more cost-effective and efficient so if we can get some synergy going between the private sector, military requirements, and help jumpstart our economy in these areas, I think it can really start to produce sort of that good feeling, less politicization, more jobs, more economic impact, kind of like the space race did right back in the 60s when we saw these spin-off technologies and the Americans were united. Not everybody agreed that we needed to spend all those billions of dollars spent sending a man to the moon. But in the end, all Americans were proud of what we had accomplished. And I think, you know, we're at a similar juncture uh, that we can really get ahead of the curve with a lot of public private uh, co cooperation. And Dr. Roth, I'd, I'd like to second that. And, and I thought uh, Rick's first comments when he talked about we need to, to take advantage of the national security framing, if you will, uh, and talk about you know, the specifics of protection of the infrastructure and whatever, and make it a readiness issue as well as an economic issue. Uh, I think that uh, moves us way ahead of uh, you know, the classic debate of uh, climate change or not. Uh, I think if we can again, couch it as this is important for our readiness and, it, and we've got to take this on. And, and with the, the, the vivid examples that uh, Mike provided, I, I think demonstrate that very clearly. Mm -hmm. Great, well, as we get towards the end of our time together this afternoon, um, I'd like to pose a question and maybe ask each of you to uh, provide your perspective. So. Uh, we've either directly or indir indirectly touched on um, kind of the importance of leadership in tackling these complex issues. Um, and um, I wonder if, uh, as we kind of now think about what each of us has shared, uh, the questions that have come in uh, from the audience, um, if you had to um, share one or two um, other or reemphasize particular observations about um, how we as leaders can um, most effectively step up and uh, really get our arms around these issues of climate change and security and the um, important intersection of the two. Um, what would those, uh, what were those leadership challenges or characteristics be? What are the things that um, we can think about doing um, individually uh, to make us each more prepared and more effective uh, in helping to um, kind of move the needle forward on uh, these particular issues. So maybe we can go in the same order that um, each of the panelists um, uh, presented. Uh, so why don't we start with you, Dr. Barnett. Thanks, Marty. I think um, the, the point I'd wanna reemphasize is the, the importance of developing leaders who are gonna serve at the senior level uh, well into complexity and, and a collaboration before they get to that senior level uh, so that they're able to uh, uh, lead in, in a collaborative environment, I think, would, would be the most important for me. Great, thank you. Dr. Walker? I think the integrity is very important. It's important for us all to understand, for me to understand how important integrity, both perceived and actual is. I think being informed, uh, and being informed means reading a variety of things, not just those things that you agree with, and talking with people, not just those you that, that you agree with, and remembering that the leader isn't a boss. The leader is someone who is able, because of skill and uh, personal characteristics and knowledge, uh, to move things forward in a team way. 
uh, and that we each have a part to play, whether we are in charge of a unit or whether we're part of that unit. Great, thank you. Mike, how about you? I think the uh, leadership has a big role to play in uh, aligning motivations, if I can use that term. So as uh, General Devereaux said, you know, while I might be motivated to produce something new so I don't have to run a fuel supply convoy, uh, I'm going after the same end state as somebody that's more concerned simply about reducing carbon emissions. And if you can bridge that gap, that uh, that, that motivations may may uh, come internally from you know different points of view perspectives. It's like Dr. Walker said: the, the end state of this, the, the practical practical uh, end state is is the same. And by embracing different motivations, we we hopefully bring more people into the circle. And I think it takes leadership to do that. Thank you. And Rick? Yeah, I would agree with Admiral White on that one. I, to me, leadership has always been about vision. It's about change and generating an enthusiastic, exciting vision for the future. And I think we have an opportunity to do that instead of making this a negative in terms of how do we fix a, a problem that our world is facing, turn it into a positive. How do we get on this, this train of uh, green technology that we know is our future, but how do we accelerate the pace of that change in a way that's uh, good for all Americans and for, for folks around the world? So uh, it's an excellent opportunity for leadership. I think historians are gonna look back and that they're gonna cite that as the uh, deciding factor as to whether we succeed or fail. Thank you. Um, glad I asked the question because those were four uh, excellent perspectives uh, that I know I enjoyed. I'm sure our audience did as well. Uh, so I want to thank uh, the four of you again for uh, spending your afternoon with us. I think this was a, a very enlightening um, panel and um, great discussion on a, a complex issue and unfortunately one that's going to be increasingly complex um, as technology continues to evolve and the, uh, the pace of change um, and innovation uh, leads to additional complexity. Uh, but nonetheless, um, all, dis, um, all these issues um, have to begin with uh, communications and discussion. And I think we um, uh, created a, a great foundation for that today. Uh, so once again, wanna thank our uh, partners at ASP uh, for co-hosting this workshop with us. Um, those of you that um, were able to join us, um, we're grateful that you did. Um, and as we mentioned, we'll be happy to circulate the uh, recording for those of you uh, that attended and, and registered. So thank you all very much. And we look forward to seeing you back here uh, virtually or in person uh, here at the University of Charleston. So have a great day, everybody.